Hi, everyone. I am Jennifer Hancock, uh, and I'm a board member for the International Humanistic Management Association. And my colleague Elizabeth is with us today. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest today is Dean Carter. He is the Vice President of Human Resources and Shared Services at Patagonia. Uh, he's been there since May 2015, and he provides strategic leadership and direction of Patagonia's global human resources, finances, and legal teams, and is charged with developing initiatives to support the nearly 2,000 employees worldwide in carrying out the mission. And he's going to talk to us about how to make sure culture makes it down to the very bottom of your organization. So, Dean, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am so glad you agreed to have this conversation. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks for such an easy topic, um, getting culture all the way through the company. I, you know, I, I have, I've had the opportunity in my career to work for a few companies with a variety of cultures. And, um, you know, my, my, my first big HR experience was with Fossil. And at the time was a hot growth company and a really extraordinary culture really wrapped around, um, fun and fashion like it was just about not taking yourself too seriously but you know realizing that that's what that was about at the time and um and then uh from fossil i went to sears and i was there for a period of time and as you know you guys can imagine sears current and tenured history that was quite a culture to manage and i'll, and I'll talk about that in a moment and then from sears i went to patagonia and if you know much about the culture you likely know that sears and um, Patagonia have nothing in common whatsoever. And so I just, culture is culture. So we, I could talk to you about the culture at Sears and I would be talking about a culture and, um, or the culture at Patagonia. So they have, each of them have these very unique ones. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, to, to tell you a little bit about Patagonia and what I'll be sharing the most on, it is, it is, it is a, the culture was set long before I got there in the very intense ways. And it's very clear that the entire culture of Patagonia wraps around this mission. Our mission is to save our whole planet. And every decision and everything that's done is to do that. We will cut businesses like we did yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, because we feel like that particular business or growth mechanism isn't in line with saving the home planet, which could mean hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in net sales. And we make these decisions all the time to cut business because it's not in line with saving the planet. Um, we hire people who are activists who are looking to do something about saving the planet. If you don't believe in climate change, it's the worst place in the world to work. It is, uh, and that is what everyone is coming there to do. And then we work to let people live their whole selves in this. If we hire people who love the planet, we let them love the planet. Like they get to go outside, which is why our founder wrote a book, Let My People Go Surfing, which is the foundation of the Patagonia culture. And if you've read Let My People Go Surfing, you know about the Patagonia culture and it's, and it's pretty much as Yvonne describes, surprisingly. And um, which means, you know, it's a balance of work and life. Um, we haven't done a great job of that this year in COVID and all the things going on. It's been a challenge, but for the most part, when the surf's up, you surf. When the powder's down, you ski. We um, not just have child care on site, but, but children are an integrated part. It's not unusual to have, you know, an attorney sitting on his desk with a, a baby on the desk and he's feeding them in the middle of a meeting. Like it is as long as they're not disruptive in the meeting and the parent is interrupted, that's, these things happen all the time. So, and we, we, have, we integrate our elders as well in our culture. We revere them, they tell us stories and they keep us in line with the past, the, 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 the past and the present and our future of the company. So it's this very integrated community from kids to elders focused completely on the mission in every wild and crazy, insane way that you can possibly imagine. And I can probably give you some stories on that. But I just want to give you a background on Patagonia um, a bit. And, uh, and we can kind of maybe start there. And uh, kind of on my background and the other two companies. Sure. 
So that is awesome. And it's always funny with Zoom now, people are like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, my kid. We had that happen on the phones. We're like, we're humans. You have kids. Yep. It's okay. I know. And I, I love the idea of normalizing that. It is very normalized to the point where, I mean, I've been in board meetings where someone is at the board meeting nursing. And it is, it is just things that you, you know, are and typically you don't see become very real and part of understanding kind of these things are what life is about. And if you're saving the home planet at the end of the day, who are you saving it for? Right. True. I get a reminder of that every single day. And, and the other thing in terms of its impact on culture, you can't be a jerk around your kids. Like they're, they're like, they're watching, like they can see you. And it's, it really is hard to be, you know, a jerk around your kids or other people's children. There's, it does, kind of, you do bring a little bit of your better self. Around. Yeah, it would be really hard to dress someone down if their kid is like right there. <laughs> right there, oh, they're like, they're all over. The, the entire first floor of every building is children. Okay, so one of the reasons I wanted to have you on and have this conversation is, you know, I do bullying and harassment work. I use behavioral science for that. And when I get called into a company, the first thing I do is I look at Glassdoor and I see what kind of problems they have because people go to Glassdoor to complain. No one ever goes mm -hmm. to Glassdoor yeah, and say, true. this is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's always, and, and almost everything is, I love the company. I love what they stand for. I love all the perks. What I don't like is my direct report. All right, so when we talk about how do we make it down to everybody, right? How do we make sure right. that, and there's your dogs with the, <laughs> with the contractor anyways uh, but know, how do, <laughs> must, they must see him now so right, it's ooh, excitement him. someone to come play um but anyway so how do you make sure that this lovely corporate culture that you're enjoying at the higher levels yeah. and in the, the main building makes it to the janitor of one of your stores how do you make yeah. sure that the, a clerk that was just hired on experiences this um you know at the lowest levels that's, um, that is the crux of probably just the thing that we do. People get to experience the culture at Patagonia. You get to hang out with the kids and you can feel the work people are doing to save the planet. You get to experience the, the deepness of the culture. Now, what you can see in the background, um, what that also means is like, you can have managers delivering the culture and be horrible managers. Like they're, they're not doing goal setting or they are in conversations with people. Um, they, they, they make them, they make them feel bad about the work they're doing. Or they're just like, we have some bad managers. Um, like a lot of companies do. We do a good job of delivering the culture for the most part, but what we are, you know, challenged. And I think just like every company you challenge with like just bad managers in terms of goal setting, holding, um, uh, holding poor performers accountable and lifting and raising up and recognizing good performers. Um, so yeah, and those are things that we work on. I can tell you on the culture part, ways that we embed culture from the very you know, start. If I, you know, the, all the way down to the janitor or front desk, um, the, fr the person at the front desk actually is the person who does or has done for years our onboarding. Um, and I can just, if I show you just very quick, if I can get to this, um, this is, let me see, here it is. If I, if I, let me see if I can share my screen with you for just a second. Um, all right, no, this isn't working out. Here we go. All right, share screen and here. Can you see my screen? See the guys? This is my new orientation, and this is the front desk guy at New Hire Orientation, and we're, we're all about to serve. And uh, he's showing us and teaching us about Patagonia and the culture. So we literally don't have HR doing this. We have someone who is on the front line, um, and his name is Chipper Bro. He's actually the one um, doing onboarding for the company, and he's our biggest ambassador, or has been until he retired. Um, for the company, and he was at the front desk for, I think, 20 years um, as our biggest and best ambassador. So your, your onboarding starts kind of with, um, you know, Chipper at the front desk, and that's continued all the way through. We hire for culture, um, and what I mean by that is not culture fit, 
we hire for people who care about the planet. And we work really hard on that particular issue in terms of making sure people don't confuse that. Where there's not like this fit, but we do have to have shared values around saving the planet and, and lo being, loving the outdoors. That, that's it, that's the minimum part. And we work really hard to do that. When we get that wrong, um, you know, it's not, it's not uh, people usually don't like to work there. When we hire people who don't care about the planet or don't wanna be outside, because there's a culture that embraces those things. Um, so anyhow, I think from, from hiring to who we reward, who we promote, and for the most part, like all cultures, if I go back to Fossil and Sears and Patagonia, often the culture represents whoever is in, who's the senior person. Like it is, if you, that their behavior is the culture. The, the culture of, of Sears was the head of Sears Eddie Lampert. The culture of Fossil was the head of um, Fossil and the founder of the company. I often say, you know, what's the culture like when CEOs like, I want a good culture. I'm like, well, hold up a mirror. That's the culture. And if you want to change it, that's who you need to start with. So no matter what we say, what we do, how many plaques, how many training, all the hiring, all those things we can do, if it's not exhibited at the most senior level, then nothing changes. And, or it does change, it just mirrors whoever that person is. Sure, so you mentioned bad managers. I wanna go back to that for a little bit. Um, and how do you audit and monitor them? And um, what kind of interventions do you use if you, you know, if you hire someone in good faith and it turns out that their manager skills are either not up to snuff or their idea of what a manager is is a little dictatorial. <laughs> <laughs> whatever the right, issue is, nothing. how do you audit and monitor that and, and work with that, that problem? Yeah, we have a, what we call the great, um, uh, great manager survey. And so we survey the organization with a series of questions. We do that biannually and understand kind of who are, how, what's the experience people are having with their particular manager. And then if we see challenges from the great manager survey, then we do interventions. And so we start with data and then we go to just very human listening. And we do listening sessions to understand because data is important and it can point you in the right direction, but it really can't tell you the whole story. And you'd have to just listen to people's stories. And, uh, and then from there, if we have a significant issue we need to deal with, we um, of course start with coaching for the, the person that, that needs it. We do some um, education and, and learning with them. And if they respond, that's great. And if they don't, then we either find another role from the company that's more appropriate. And then at times we've had to move on from managers who couldn't you know, behave in the way that's aligned with their mission and values and, and culture. And we do that. We need probably to do a lot better job of that. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the article a few years back from Gallup. Who, they took, God, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of data points about great managers. And at the end of this big giant research paper and survey, Gallup determined that seven out of 10 managers are bad. As a matter of fact, they will always be bad. And like all the training that you apply, you can get one more good one. If you just really try, you can get maybe four good ones, four out of 10. So part of what we also try to do, you know, we, the bad, bad, bad managers, we deal with it, but how do you help people be more autonomous in their own leadership, write their own goals, be more proactive in their career? And how do we create tools that are more employee focused so they can help do things and not everything go through the manager on it too. So we build strong managers, we deal with bad managers, but we also do the work that we can to empower employees to not be stuck behind a bad manager. They happen to be the person who, what the seven and 10 who happens to get one. So, okay, well, that is, that is a perfect launching point for the next question yeah. I wanted to ask, which is what are the responsibilities of employees to ensure that the culture, corporate culture makes it to them? So if you're, if you have an employee who's got a, one of the managers who either needs assistance or is just really not cut out for manager roles, what is their responsibility? And is how is that communicated to them and how are they supported if they come forward? Yeah, it is. Well, we hope that they'll be A, either genuine on the survey and 
tell us how they're generally feeling. And it's an anonymous um, survey, so they can do that anonymously. That's why we go into the listening sessions. We have to create a atmosphere of trust um, to even for people to speak up during the listening sessions. So the role is, you know, if you see something, say something, and that's just not about your own experience. I think sometimes the biggest challenge is when people don't say something about experiences that they're in the room and they see someone else, the victim of bullying or really bad managers or bad behaviors. And often the person who is the victim isn't saying something. And so we do, a, we're working on now doing a lot of work for kind of a see something, say something. So it's, it's not putting all the burden on the person who's the victim, but if you're in the room and you see this, um, you're, you're part of it, possibly complicit, and, uh, and you, need to, you, you have a role in saying something. So it's not just about, we don't put all the burden on the person. We're trying to put more of a focus also on the community and saying something when they see these things happen. So it's not just one person who's like, okay, here's, here's, this is what happened to me. Okay. Um, so l let's talk about, you know, one of the questions people have when they encounter companies that have lofty culture ambitions as Patagonia does, the question comes up, how has that helped or hind and or hindered Patagonia to adapt to their business? You know, what are the pros and cons of it? Because nothing's ever all 100% good. Yeah. Well, he'll, he'll, this is my golden um, Ivy. Okay, honey, got to get down. Um, so he, I'll, I'll talk first on how it's hindered our, our culture. Um, our culture operates under a lot of paradoxes. So in it's a, it, it can feel slow to make decisions in the culture. So we're not a speedy culture to, to make decisions. At one time, you know, we are, we are a business and we have to do the things to grow the business. And at the other time, we're saving the planet. So what, when we make decisions around product, businesses, partners, those things, what is the balance of save and grow or business and, you know, destruction of the planet? Um, most of the things that we make have some level of destruction of the planet and extract resources to do that. There's no other way to put it. And, um, and some are more destructive than others. What we do try to do is make the most extraordinary product that, you know, never goes in a landfill. You can repair it. We'll take it back. But at the same time, it's extractive. And, and we've made business decisions on product to pull things out. That makes it tough because if you move away from business, how does that impact staffing? Do you, how do you, you know, um, make sure you have a responsible bottom line? So these paradoxes make it difficult to make decisions. And sometimes we're slow around product, businesses, and other things. I can say we get to efficient decisions, but not speedy decisions. And that can be very frustrating in a culture. To our advantage though, when we make decisions that are so unbelievably clear around what we need to do and what is in front of the culture, then decisions happen very fast um, at all levels of the company. When in 2016, when um, we were, you know, fall of 2016, we were concerned about the planet because of some things happening in the world. You know, we, Black Friday was coming up and we weren't sure what to do. We're having a lot of conversations across the company and a junior part person in marketing said, you know, I know we give 1% to the planet. What if we gave on Black Friday, 100% to the planet, like all of our top sign line sales, not just in the US, but in the world. And a mar marketing was in the meeting. It's like, okay, sent a text to the CEO. About two minutes later, the TEO, CEO sent a text to the founders. And two weeks later, we gave away 100% of all of our sales that day to the planet, which we expected to be three, $4 million, which would be a typical Black Friday. And we ended up sending $12 million and spent nothing on advertising, gained new customers. Never, There's never the intent, but these are things that happen. And probably our biggest you know, media campaign this year happened because of something like that, where a designer put, I don't know if you saw it on the back of the tag, both the out no permission, just so in line with our culture to do something like that because it's something our founder says all the time. And it became the biggest media campaign. Those pants sold like crazy. And, uh, but those are, those are places where the culture works, where you can make decisions that are right and aligned and quick 
without a lot of like, like a lot of alignment or where there is hierarchy to make decisions they're made very quickly. So the moral component helps with decision making is what I heard, but it oh, also but sure. <laughs> it also can yeah. make it difficult when the corporate needs and the moral needs are in conflict to have to work it out. Okay, so I want to give you before we open up and if you have questions, people start asking them in the chat room and we're going to start getting to them. I have one more question to Dean before we open that up. And that is you've obviously worked in uh, cultures that you like, I assume the current one is one of those that you're completely on board with, um, but also cultures at, uh, that were, let's say, challenging, because you were at Sears when uh, the dog-eat-dog -dog world was dominating. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about, you know, managing those differences and, um, you know, do, do you want to expound on that or do you have any thoughts on that without me, like, asking a direct question? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, at Sears, the you know, Patagonia is completely like anti-capitalism and consumption and like, how do we become a less, you know, uh, um, destructive capitalist economy? What are the ways can we can be a regenerative economy? So it's a lot, and a, not crazy about growth and consumption and those things. We're trying to figure out how to make that work and make business work and employ people and do that all at once. Sears is pure capital. The, all of the values at Sears are based on absolute and pure capitalism. Um, as a matter of fact, the whole inside of the company was set up in um, a capitalist environment where businesses were set up, you would get marketing resources or HR resources or other things based on your competitiveness within the company. So you, you and, and, and if someone didn't want to use HR services, they could go outside the company and get whatever HR services they want. But I wasn't, as an HR business, providing the HR services from the HR. HR was a business. We provided these services or a fee to these other businesses within the company. And uh, when capitalism works purely and perfectly, um, then this should be a way of balancing resources and we figure this all out. Um, but humans don't behave rationally. They do not. And that's why sometimes capitalism is a challenge. People behave in their own best interest. And when you have a company based on capitalism where everyone is based on their own best interest and not the interest of the community at all, then, then, then you have challenges. And I think that led to the demise of Sears. Now we had a culture and everyone lived to this culture. Everyone knew how to operate to this culture. It was crystal clear behaviors that were accepted and behaviors that were not accepted. It just wasn't a culture that led to kind of, um, uh, you know, ultimately success of that particular business. Well, Patagonia is like the complete opposite um, in terms of, you know, flexibility and the ability to collaborate, work together is about communal community and communal success. And it's just very different kinds of cultures. Um, it, you know, one, one worked in one example and working wildly and one in the particular one didn't work. Um, the other part of cultures too and understanding was like, what are you, what are you doing to the, not just to your business, but to your people? Like, how long can you work in these cultures? And it, at Patagonia, I call it the Hotel California. People check in and they do not check out. Like turnover is nothing. So the culture itself is sustainable in terms of people's lives across, you know, whatever thing they're in, single, married, kids, elder. And, uh, and at Sears, it wasn't a sustainable culture. You, 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 you moved quick and you worked hard and people kind of, it's kind of a three-year gig. Um, there's about all people could sustain. Um, that, that means you count on a continuous um, stream of incoming talent. Right, the churn. I always wonder too, it, you know, obviously the market is competitive, but this, the value of cooperation in competition, like I'm a soccer, soccer fan and the best teams work together, <laughs> you know, otherwise they don't win the world cup. You That's know, you exactly can, it. Yeah. So, you know, I think this idea of sustainability is important, especially today, like uh, in this moment that we're in. I, obviously we can all be productive 
We can be super productive when our, we're afraid for our jobs, scared for our families, scared for our health, and we can lean in and be as crazy productive in these environments as we need to be. But I do wonder, like, is what we're doing right now sustainable? How, how long could we all do this? Like if all work looked like this all the time, is it, is it sustainable? And I, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff that says productivity went up during this time, which makes complete sense. There's a lot of, there's, a, there's some opportunities for it, um, for our short-term productivity gains. But what are we, what are we missing in the human connection um, in this time? And is that sustainable? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, I think we have to pay attention to right. the sustainability of human connectivity. Cool. So Elizabeth, do we have any questions in the chat room? Otherwise, I'll just keep going with my questions. <laughs> um, no, not yet. So feel free to type questions you have um, for Dean in the chat and we'll ask them. Um, but uh, Jennifer, I do want to pop in and build off something that Dean was talking about. And how do you maintain culture remotely, uh, for example, this year? You know what, that is, uh, that is difficult because a lot of the things that our culture was based on was not, well, of course, how we work together when we're getting work done, but the, the biggest parts of the culture and what drove it were all the things that we did between getting work done. It's like what we did at picnic tables when we walk down the hall and you stop and you say hello to someone's kid and, um, oh my God, they've grown up. Like, look how big they are. And there it is. Um, you know, these in-between conversations, which connected us and helped us get things done when we needed to do business because we kind of understood where people were. There, in this moment, you know, we can't surf together. We can't eat at a picnic table together. I, I can't, no one can walk down a hall and tell someone when someone's hurting. Like you can put on your Zoom face and I don't know what just happened in your life or you've lost a parent to COVID or whatever. And so we're just missing that. And it's hard for us. Maybe it's easier for a lot of other places. Um, at the same time, you know, it's 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 a potential, you know, nirvana. Because now you can, you know, if you're in Ventura, it's hard to, and you're a skier, it's hard and you're at Patagonia because you can design ski equipment. Ventura, California is the worst place in the world to live. It, it's like, you're not a beach person. Like talking about surfing is crushing. You want to ski. So, um, you know, a lot of people are in Montana and Colorado right now during the seasonal time would like to continue to do that. So we're, there may be some things about this that we can optimize for our culture that could be very good. Um, and I think there are some things that we lose a lot in this, you know, remote. So somewhere in the middle is a really good place where we can take it, you know, learn from this and have some really good things about our culture and some things we're just going to go right back to. So it's, a, I don't think it's like a lot of things are like all remote or everyone back here. I think that, you know, we can pick and understand this is another part of a, of a menu of options for work, um, but first are certainly not a replacement. So things that we're doing, we're just trying to keep people connected trying to find informal ways, a lot of the stuff, happy hours and things like that to keep people connected. And we're just um, hoping to, and, and letting them live where they want to live and enjoy the, Enjoy the snow. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, we did have a, a question um, from Pim Mervis about um, how do you uh, extend the culture beyond the firm um, to your supply chain, for example? Yeah. Um, and would you use the same kind of onboarding and et cetera? We, it's not the same, but it's very much the same. So our warehouse and supply chain is in Reno, um, Nevada. And so instead of going surfing, they go fly fishing because they're right on a beautiful um, uh, river right outside that. And so they part of their onboarding is to go fly fishing. There's really incredible climbing spots you know, around the Reno area. So they go climbing. So instead of you know surfing and um, I guess the other one would be um, both of us visit organic farms as a part of onboarding. And they do that in the stores as a part of onboarding and they find whatever is local. You know, this was, um, Sometimes people do interpret like let my people go surfing is like surfing is the culture and that's it's a it's a it's a metaphor because like our when we opened up our Amsterdam office in Europe they're like there's no place to surf in Amsterdam how can we live the culture if there's no place to surf here and that's and we just had a lot of conversations I said this is it's not about surfing how do you get outside and enjoy 
being outdoors in Amsterdam? What does that look like? And so not too long after, you know, for a big surprise to Amsterdam, a lot of people in Patagonia started kayaking in the Grand Canal. And so there was like all these Patagonia kayaks out there. There were other things they started doing outside that were unusual. And but interestingly enough, it was like even it helped our recruiting because people could see those crazy people in Patagonia out in the river and kayaking in the canals. And um, so we, we, we try to interpret that whatever, you know, getting outside and doing what you can do for the planet in the way that makes sense for that for that particular offices, whether it's supply chain in Reno, um, whether it's Japan um, or Amsterdam. And in Reno, we do have childcare also um, on site, which is highly unusual for a warehouse um, to have on site childcare. And we, you know, where we have, you know, size in the rest of the world, we, we, we work to do that also. Um, so for your vendors, though, do you, um, how do they get in tune with your mission? Like, do you have that as part of the, the, the qualifications for them to respond to your um, procurement opportunities? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. We, um, every single one of our direct suppliers who make our product, we rate every single factory on a whole series of qualities. And um, from human rights to um, pay to, um, and also down to each one of those, um, are they putting, um, we do audits to make sure how they're interacting with the environment. And, um, and in some cases, we've provided subsidies for them to put solar panels on the factories so that they're using renewable energy instead of regular energy, which is our biggest, our biggest footprint comes from factories in, in our supply chain making product. Like if we change that, we change our footprint significantly. So we do that, we rank them all, and we publish the rankings all the way and, and say, these are the ones who are good, and these are the ones who are dirty and not okay. Even when we're doing really bad, we are in business with challenging situations. We found you know, trafficking in some of our factories, and we've immediately reported that. And then we've talked about what we're going to do about it as well. So that's a really important core part of our culture. We have a whole team that um, works to, and we also provide extra money to provide a living wage in the supply chain um, that we get from. And then we go deeper, not just to the actual supply chain, but the suppliers themselves, we, the ink factories. We look at the cotton that is grown um, for our cotton, which is processed in the factory. We try to get them to be regenerative or organic in that process. So we, um, we, we build supply chains, not owned by us, but we build them to, uh, to make sure they're done to the standard that we would like. And when they're not, we're honest about it and we work to make change. So how do you find out that there's trafficking in one of the factories that you were contracting with? I mean, how does that come about and how do you audit that? Because it seems like that's yep. something that the contractor would hide. Absolutely. And, and often they do hide these things. And then, you know, they put on their best face for us. Um, but we've been doing this for a long time. And the, a lot of suppliers that we've been working with, we've been working with for a long time as well. And they know our standards. When we, when we find this and we have auditors on the ground for all of our supply chain and factories, when we find it, then um, we either change the supplier when we can find a new supplier. We, um, we tell them they make, they make change immediately or we're going to find another supplier. Oh my Lord. Um, so those are the things that we do and, and we publish this just a second. He did warn us for everyone that, um, <laughs> the talks might require a little help. <laughs> okay. I think that was a rabbit, not the contractor. Um, all right. So yeah, that, that's an important part of our, um, who we are. And you can go on our website and see all of our factories listed and we have A, B, C, D, E. And um, yeah, that's, a, that's important. So it sounds like transparency is a really important strategy. Um, Nicole asked, you know, building on that, how do you maintain the same cultural experience in retail locations? So one of the things we heard about is that it has to be locally attuned. Reno doesn't do the same thing as Amsterdam, but still, how do you get consistency despite these variable locations? Yeah, our, our, that's a really good question and it's hard. 
Um, interestingly enough, the ones that feel like they're having the, the most Patagonia experience are our retail stores. So they're, they're the ones most stoked in the company, but that's because we don't see our stores as stores. Um, our stores are community activation centers. We have picnic tables in our stores um, and tables for to bring in activists. Our stores don't just you know sell product. What the whole goal of the store is not transactions, but helping facilitate actions. So each store works with local environmental groups to understand, okay, in this community, what are the most important things that we need to address? Or what are the groups that are really working hard? Not big groups, like the small local ones that need help. And they provide a place for them to organize. Um, they provide a place for them to connect. And then they can use our social media locally to promote their events. And um, so our stores feel really good about that work. Um, they, and so they, they feel really connected to their communities and the work that's being done locally. Our stores do have a hard time though. They're probably in our customer service groups. They're on the front line of it. You know, we're, as you, if you know Patagonia, we're quite vocal about our stance on the environment and we're quite vocal politically um, on our stance. Right? Not like Republican Democrat, but if there is a, a leader who's not supporting the, the um, climate or, um, or issues out there, we're very vocal about it as I talked about earlier. Our stores often feel the brunt of that. And sometimes that's really difficult because you know, supporting the planet and then just like this angry person who doesn't believe in climate change yelling at the stores. And so they, they do a really good job of balancing that, but it's probably one of the most difficult you know, things to work through, but they, they're, they're a, a hardy bunch and, um, and, and, and really you know, seem to figure that out. We, do, we give them a lot of support around that, but yeah. It's great that you gave them a shout out because yeah, I do the, think the frontline workers are the ones that are really the heart and soul of a company usually. Um, Volker they asks are. a really good question, um, building on something you started out with. Um, he said, it, what, what, how is Patagonia experiencing the limits of growth? Um, does the company need growth to maintain its employment level? Yeah, we have not, our problem with growth hasn't been, you know, not enough for sure in over several years. As a matter of fact, the biggest conversation we have at the board level is how to control growth. And so we want to do that in a way which, you know, provides a good living for employees and we can grow, you know, with that and make sure that we can give them pay increases and do all the things that we need to do or uh, respond to issues like that are happening right now. And, but we also want to make sure that we're not, you know, people, you know, you, you, what gets measured gets done. So we always have to focus on, you know, are we, are we talking about financials too much? Are, are we talking about carbon and clean water and fresh oceans and how much more can we talk about those things? We, growth is okay. It's not a bad word. It's just not something we're going to pursue. Gr growth should be something that happens organically. So we're not going to have a marketing campaign to sell things. We, we would have a, a campaign around um, the climate. We have a campaign about here's a product and here's what it does, but it, it should never sell. And sometimes we catch it like a marketer who's new or someone who doesn't get it and they're like, do something that's a, a sell. Um, then we'll go back or we'll open up a new account that we probably shouldn't have opened up because it's not in line with our values. So we're kind of like always checking growth all the time and making sure that it's growth is not a driver. It is an outcome of just making really extraordinary product and connecting with communities. So it's a uh, growth happens, but it's not, it's not a, a goal. Um, but we do, we do make sure that we have enough to give our companies. This was a rough year though, this for sure. Like we, all of our stores were closed and e-commerce was closed for a month and this was a tough year. So we, we did have to let go of some folks because it just, the volume wasn't there for this year. And it, it wasn't like this, you know, it was a cliff. And so that was, it was a hard year for us. It's a culture of punch for sure. Um, Nelson asked a question about um, when most companies say um, save the planet, they're generally referring to the environment and not necessarily factoring in social or, or economic inequality. Um, how's Patagonia's views and actions in this more expansive sense of um, sustainability? That is such a good question. Traditionally, we and for years, we have leaned into um, saving wild places on uh, the 1% for the planet goes to local grassroots environmental efforts. Um, 
But over the past couple years, um, we have realized like it, we, we have to think differently about you know how we're saving the planet. And where, where there is the intersection between you know, um, uh, the environment and environmental justice and saving the planet environmental justice, we make sure we know who we're saving the planet for. And um, we are connecting more and we have, you know, in a lot of the work we've done around public lands, we partner strongly with indigenous communities to do that. We still have some room to go on how we um, save what is, you know, public land or stolen land, whatever you want to argue, like that is, you know, it's stolen land. And then how do we call it, you know, public land and what's the work that we do around that? But it's important for us to make sure that we partner and do the right thing. So that's one example. And then we're working more um, and have created an entire team to, uh, to understand our role in environmental justice. So they're not just protecting um, beautiful places for white people to surf and climb that we're looking at the people who are most impacted, which, you know, in coastal areas along rivers, such as the one in Europe that we're working to protect right now for the dam that's being put up. Um, these aren't wealthy people who live along this area. They're quite, in, in, you know, they're, they're heavily um, disadvantaged and we've been working to help them. So, again, this is, um, so it is a, uh, it's something we have to work on, we have to get better at. Um, it wasn't where it wasn't where the company was founded, um, and so like a lot of companies and a lot of the outdoor industry that was you know founded by a white climber and focused on climbing and surfing and fishing, um, we're expanding you know who we support and how we see ourselves. So there's a lot of interaction with the company and introspection and what we need to do on that. It's a really good question, and we're we're working on it. Um, Sunita asked kind of a similar question. Um, no company is perfect. So if you had to identify maybe one or two opportunities for improvement, where do you see your ambitions for, you know, upping the game even more than what you're already doing? Well, that ties to the question we just talked about. So we've got to get a lot, a lot better at engaging um, communities who are most impacted by climate change. And so we haven't done a great job of that. Um, and so that is the first thing that we will, that will be our big, big change with Patagonia. The second thing is understanding a business model that is more based on um, the circular economy and increasingly less based on the consumption economy. So how can we um, put product in the market and then, you know, if people want, we can purchase it back and then clean it up, resell it, make sure that, you know, maybe our business around reselling, renting, um, the circular economy is as big as the business that we're doing to consume. So that is our other kind of big challenge. Now on the people side, I think uh, the very first question is the absolute best question. Like, how do I make sure that we have a management team at all levels of the company that is delivering the pro this really extraordinary promise of what this experience can be? And we have varying degrees of that of the delivery of that promise, and um, and so that's you know you know one of my biggest challenges is as we grow, add more stores and more locations that 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 is fulfilled, and we have we have some work to do. Just I think like a lot of folks, it, that, that's a hard one. Uh, yeah, we're all works in progress, right? Um, True. Uh, so Toller asks a, a great question. I mean, not all of us are lucky enough to work at a company like Patagonia. So if we were frontline employees at, say, more of a Sears-like company, yeah. um, how do you, op as a you know frontline person with little formal authority, how do you open up higher levels of in-management to this type of culture change? Well, it depends. Some things you know you can change on cultures. So like you've probably heard the phrase, you know, one way to change culture is use change management. And if that doesn't work, you change management. And, um, and you know, if you've got, you know, someone who's leading in, you know, a leadership position, like I said before, they are, they are a lot of what culture is. So then you find ways of picking out the best parts of that culture and reframing what feels good to people. Now, of course you, want to influence in terms of change, in terms of bad behavior or other things that are cultural, maybe not in line even with the company's values. But it's at a place like Sears, we pulled out some things and to, to 
to feel good about what you were doing, the things we pulled out and said, okay, the world is changing digitally. We have a leader who only speaks in data. So you know what, let's take this time and be the best data speaking HR department and organization that there could absolutely possibly be. So we leaned in and made this extraordinary team of people who are human and data focused. Every single position going forward in HR had to have some sort of data background in it because it was the value that this particular company valued. And by the way, it is incredibly valued in the market right now. Of my direct reports, all of them became heads of HR and several people underneath that became heads of HR because they understood how to use data and to make decisions and then they could operate in other cultures. And just that focusing kind of of the culture, even in bad cultures, like what is good with this, understand it, pull it out, reframe it and help people see it and then go, okay, as a result of being here, I am better for this experience. And that's usually what people want out of companies and cultures. Like, what am I better for of this? If it's all just take, 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 then, you know, that's a crushing culture. But sometimes our role is to reframe the experience. And like, if you just look at the Sears experience at the, at the store level or wherever, it could be crushing. At the same time, if you go, okay, let's talk about what this experience is and what are you learning and how are you growing, how this preparing you either for better things at Sears or better things somewhere else. Um, that, that was the way we um, were able to interpret that particularly very challenging culture and, and, and people stayed, they like, okay, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm learning more. I feel like as a result of being here, I'm better for this and more prepared for whatever's next. Um, so that, I don't know if that's a great answer, but you, 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 you have to influence the, the, the leader and whatever they choose to behave, there's your influence point, And then everything will change. Culture is not bottom up. It is. It, well, it's a it's a great answer, and I just wrote it down, so it was a good answer. Okay. <laughs> and um, Vanessa asked a question. Um, if you could speak to um how Patagonia is addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another really good question. So, Patagonia has um, long been the gold standard. So there's a lot of ways you look at it for, for gender diversity. And I wanna talk about this because that's how the same way we're gonna approach what we need to do for um, diversity of race and get a lot more BIPOC employees into the organization and make sure the more inclusive environment. But for gender, when we were having problems with gender years and years ago, years ago we looked at the system. Like, just hiring more women and putting them in the situation wasn't working. We looked at the full system of what we were doing. So one example is we put in childcare. If, if in a situation that happens in America right now, 30% of women do not return to the workforce after having a child, 30. How can women move forward if 30% as a, as a group move forward if of your workforce, 30% are dropping out every time they have a child. If in this, when women are working and they're nursing or taking care of kids, because a lot of this, no matter what, often falls to women, they can't work at the same level as men or the other counterparts who don't have children. So at Patagonia, like if you have to travel to an event, we'll pay for the mom and nanny and all the travel for, them, for the person to continue their career, operate at the same level as they want as everyone else. When we, when we changed the system, women got promoted. Women got paid at a rate of men. Women stayed. As a matter of fact, almost 100% of our women returned from like 99.9% .9 return from leave because we have very generous leave practices. And women, in my whole career, I can't tell you how many women were crying on their first day with their baby that they had just left miles away at childcare or the women that didn't return. But I just remember people sitting at their desks and just crying about this moment and it's not right. And so I, I just see Patagonia change the system and women stayed and women elevated. And so we're trying to find ways to change the system at Patagonia systemically, like what's in the way or what are barriers in terms of how we're bringing on talent in terms of who we're sourcing and attracting. What part of the system do we need to change? What part of the selection system do we need to change? 
How do we make sure we prepare systemically an environment of Patagonia where people, when they come, they feel safe and quickly included in an environment that's predominantly, honestly, white, which has been that way for a very long time. So we're looking at you know every single way to examine, change our systems, and also not just that, how do we, what do we stand up for? What do we speak out for? It's not unusual to see a lot of work that Patagonia has done around the climate, but how do we, for us to become a lot more anti-racist company, um, you're gonna hear our voice a lot more is speaking out um, for kind of first inclusion and things that we feel a lot is, that is not right publicly and in, in the same way that we speak. So this isn't an overnight change. We have to evolve to this and we're in the process of doing that um, right now. We are not there, but we're 100% we're committed. It would, it, it's, it is a, it's a, it's a, a human commitment as much as anything but it's also so tied to our mission. Like there's, there is no way to save the planet without engaging people who are impacted the most by it. There's a difference between impacted by the most, by your community and rising ocean waters and um, dirty water in Flint, then you can't ski. There, there's, there's a difference. And so we realize that. And so we're, we're, we're making change, not just our business model, but um, how we interpret and see our mission. Excellent. I want to do a real quick, if anybody is interested in getting a certificate of completion for this, this is approved by HRCI and SHRM for continuing education credits. And we also offer a general um, certificate of completion. So if you want that, I need your name and your email in which certificates, and you can ask for all three or just one of them that you want. So name, email, and which certificates you want in the chat. Elizabeth? Um, great. Uh, that's all the questions that we have right now. Um, uh, Dean, if you were talking about um, uh, somebody in a leadership position, how would they, um, and they, they had a company that they wanted to move in the direction of Patagonia, what would be your like one, two, and three talking points to guide them? The first one is what are your values? What do you value? Not the list of 10, the list of three. Like just tight, 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 tight. And now, because they're your values, not just like what everyone has, like integrity, like what <laughs> like that, that appears on everyone's. Find the value that most matters to this person. And then in every way possible, you know, there's a book, um, Change the Culture, Change the Game, and um, written by Roger Connors. And Roger says this, and I have never forgotten it, and it means everything. Um, experiences change beliefs. Beliefs change behavior, behavior shapes culture. So experiences shape your beliefs, your beliefs change your behavior, behavior shapes your culture. If you don't start with the experience that you're delivering, you will never change culture. Too many companies focus on the behavior. Hey, this is our culture, behave like this. And why aren't you behaving like this? I'm gonna performance manage you because you're not behaving like this or not hire you or not promote you, you're not behaving. What, what they'll find is you've not delivered a wild, incredible, extraordinary experience that says, this is what we value. And you know, like at Patagonia, we value women and the way to show that we have on-site childcare. We have a lot of things that let women lift. We fly the nanny with them. That is such a wild like value. We have a lot of examples of, of that at Patagonia that we're real clear on our values and then the founders for years have found these wild ways to, for people to go, okay, we value activists. And because we value activists, if you go and protest and you get put in jail, we will pay for your jail. We will pay for your court time. We pay for all your time off if you are going through jail. And if you're with your spouse and your spouse is put in jail, we'll pay for them too. Like, and we do a lot of training to, in advance to make sure, because we don't want anyone in jail. But it's one of those wow experiences. Oh, you, we don't just say we value activism. We create an experience which says we value activism, which is completely different. So anyway, a lot of companies have them on plaques and they try to change the behavior. And whoever's doing this, number one thing, get a value and live it wildly and create experiences. And the other thing is weed your garden. This is hard work. You constantly have to like 
weed your culture garden. People who have are not living it, hires that didn't make it, people who um, leaders, you have to make tough decisions sometimes. If they're like I said, use change management or change management. Like you, it only takes one leader not living the culture for everyone to go, okay, they're here. Like what? That's they're not living the values. So um, I'm gonna it's just two. Live the values wildly, change management or change management. I think those are just like if you want to teach and train and work and check the system, but if you can't do that, you gotta make tough decisions. Um, great, thank you so much. Um, and I love the the quote and the book you recommended. Um, somebody else asked in the, one of the earlier questions if you had any other recommendations for books or resources where people can dig into this a bit more. You know what? That's good. This change the culture, change the game is very very good. Um, and I, it, Roger Connor, and there's also one health whole series. Um, the Oz Principle is with this, and it was really helpful in some work I've, I've always done in culture, and I always go back to his work. Um, I'm a huge fan of John Boudreau. I'm going to actually be talking with him this afternoon. Beyond HR is one of the great ones around kind of working through culture, um, and he, John is fantastic. The other person in understanding the psychology of culture underneath it, if you, um, if you haven't worked with or done watch some of David Rock's work around your brain at work and understanding how um, kind of the neuroscience of brain work, how you can use that to keep leverage and change culture, I think is super fascinating. Those are three people I follow a lot. Um, thank you. Uh, the one, I guess maybe one of our last questions is, um, uh, let's see, uh, what was it like entering Patagonia? Is the culture baked in or how do you get buy-in or some other entry experience over time? Um, I mean, my experience, I'm still surprised I got picked. So I have, uh, I like the Sears guy. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, this is gonna happen. Um, which speaks to, you know, who Patagonia picks. Like if you, they want to talk to you and find out, because I do care about the planet and the climate. And, you know, just because I'm a Sears guy, you know, that, that, that doesn't indicate who I am. So they're, that's what we try to find. I think um, if you love, if you love the planet and you love to be outside in some way, what, whatever that way looks like, it, it feels a little bit like Nirvana. Like, you, <laughs> like there's a whole bunch of people who, who care about and love what you do. And I, and I think if I just, um, the, the, the part about getting into Patagonia, like it, it is tough. We, we have a lot of applicants, you know, with the company, but the best way is um, live your value. What we just catch people, you know, we say the best way to get a job is get caught doing it. So we, you know, when we're out protesting or doing activist work, we run into other activists and they talk and like, well, I do accounting. You're like, really? Well, we have an accounting job open in accounting. You should apply for that. And so, you know, it's, it's people we meet along the way. Um, and, uh, and also just, you know, in, when we have conversations, it's like, let's talk about, you know, tell us about your passion for um, taking care of the planet and what are you doing? Because that's what we're, that's what we're all about. And, and, you know, that's, that's, in terms of the end of Patagonia, that's, you know, the best way. And for me, you know, I, Patagonia is a constant thump on the head. Just when I think that I'm thinking deep enough, they're like, have you thought about this? I'm like, no, oh my gosh, that's, I could do more. When you think about kind of how we work with people and environmental justice and social justice, Patagonia is like a thump on the head. I'm like, oh my God, we've got to get deeper and do more. And I, and I, the thing about Patagonia and most people say, and this is what I say, Patagonia helps me be the person that I really want to be. Every other company was this deep struggle with who I want to be and who the company was dragging me to be, both in terms of my life and my time and my values. And so, I don't know, Patagonia for most people helps you live them deeper in ways that you just kind of hadn't thought about before. I love that quote, Dean. Thank you so much. That's a great way to wrap up. Um, Jen, do you want to close it, bring us home? Yeah, no, thank you so much, Dean. I think, you know, I echo someone who just said this was a really deep, insightful conversation. And so I want to thank you for coming and being willing to have this conversation because not a lot of companies are willing to talk about what's not working and how to fix it. Um, you know, because often they're, they're trying to project this 
image and you guys are just raw and open and human about it. So I want to thank you for taking your time today and joining us. Well, Jennifer and Elizabeth, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I, I know everyone's working hard on this stuff. So keep at it and we'll all just keep talking and learning together because I don't, no one's got it figured out. I can tell you that. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Again, this was the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn uh, from the International Humanistic Management Association. The video of this is going to be online. Um, and if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, do so. Um, become a member and we will see you back in January. Bye. Have a good Bye. one. Yeah. Bye. Thanks so much, Dean.